Hello, welcome to FireDev, a fireside chat with people in the industry. Today, my guest is Daniel Johnson. Daniel, how are you? Hi, Farhan. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm doing really good today, so uh, this is going to be fun. Good stuff. So, you know, first of all, do you want to explain to the audience what PlayChain is, you know, the company you work for? Sure, I can definitely do that. So um, we do web-free gaming. Uh, in general, we have um, different uh, products for the web-free industry. So web-free is when you include crypto and the NFTs, but we have um, a few different game projects going on. We have a game platform as well, which includes like the auction house and so on for NFTs. What the general idea here is to try and remove the friction into web-free and make it all accessible to, to everybody, basically. Okay. And like... Are there any projects right now that are publicly available that the audience can go and you know get hold of that you have worked on, that PlayChain's yes. worked on? Yes, most definitely. Um, we have War Legends, which is a 4 versus 4 tank MOBA where the tanks, heroes, and abilities are all NFTs. So you can uh, play the game, earn them, sell them, do whatever you want with them. It's a, it's a pretty cool project. And then we have um, Continuum World, which is like a... Um, it's like a city builder, but like multiplayer and a farming game at the same time. It's like a full universe where everything is 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 uh, customizable, farmable, and so on. You can you should definitely go check that out. Okay, and you know, you're saying you're using web free technologies, you know, like blockchain, mm-hmm. NFTs, that sort of stuff. You know, what are those technologies enabling you to do that you? otherwise could not because you know i have this conversation with people that are for you know these new technologies and people Mm -hmm. not necessarily i'll say against but you know you know they definitely play devil's advocate when it comes to it and like some people say you know a lot there's many companies out there that are web free but they don't need to be so like what are you using the web free technology for that we could not do in web 2 yes most definitely so um I totally agree with you. There's a lot of projects that are using web free that don't really need to use web free. I think the main benefits from it is that the economy is controlled by the players, so they get to choose what they want to do with their items in the game or outside the game. And then there's also a very different way of doing the whole business model from the game developer's perspective. There's um, just many more, much more interesting ways to raise funds and build a project based on your community and the start. It's a good way of, uh, of of seeing like what's the interest in this game how much do the players actually want to invest in this and this idea there's a lot to do with DAOs which is decentralized autonomous organizations which is like there's a voting machine where people can basically the players or the users can vote on the direction for the game which I think is very very interesting because in traditional gaming it's a lot of the time it's just a big studio trying to make a lot uh, push as much profit out of the games as possible where in this case the, the users will get to choose what the the whole user experience will be. Okay, so so those DAOs, uh, I mean, how do they specifically work from a user's perspective? You know, what do they do? Because you said you know they can basically vote on you know how your work. Like, w- w- uh, is it just like you know buttons? They have like a multiple choice. They type something in, and what sort of restrictions, if any, are applied within the DAOs rules, or is it literally they can vote however they please so it depends on the DAO itself um there's one of the main issues is that the friction to actually get in and start using these is far too high right now it's, it's hard for gamers to get in and understand these mechanics and that's what we're all working on trying to figure out how to to make everything in web free more accessible and easy to understand a lot of the projects have uh, basically they're like okay so this is a hard part of web free and then they end up building a solution that just makes it more complex i'm trying to remove all the steps i'm trying to get all the the extra click out of the way the extra information that you don't actually need to know as a player um, and that's what we're doing with the uh, with the play in games platform as well we're trying to make sure that the economies work uh, between the games and everything is as easy as possible and you don't even get introduced for web free concepts before you get further into the games and you actually need them 
for example, um, War Legends has um, no barrier to entry in the sense that it's free to play. You don't need a wallet. You don't need anything related to crypto to start playing. You can just play it like a normal game. But if you want to, you can connect the wallet later on, pull out your NFTs, you can trade them on the auction house and so on. So uh, that's I think that's the way into the gamers' hearts. If they don't know that there's <laughs> web free basically, and then they figure it out, and then they're like, "Oh, this is pretty interesting." It's a bit like um, like the the Steam auction house or workshop, I think it's called, where um, where you can trade between the games, right, and and uh, and so on. In this case, you'll just never lose your items, which is uh, also nice because Steam and actually owns these items on their database, right? So they could just close down the server anytime they want. When it comes to, to Web3, you'll be owning this NFT because you are the uh, set as the owner in the in the chain, right? Um, and in regards to DAOs and how the voting works, it's usually, this is not always the case, but usually it's based on the amount of tokens that you own on that specific DAO. So let's say a, a DAO has like a million tokens, you own maybe 20,000 or something like that, then you will get a share, like a percentage. This is the value of your vote. And it'll usually just be like multiple choice. So it's like, okay, so do we want to add multiplayer? Do we want to, uh, and then it's just like a yes, no. And then there's a public vote on that. But it could also be between like six different features. What are you the most interested in and so on? Um, usually, there's um, the the idea is that uh, the more invested the players are, the more they should also have to say, right? So if you put two hundred thousand into a project, obviously you should have a lot more to say than the guy who put five bucks in. <laughs> um, but in the end of the day, there's not necessarily the guy of the two hundred thousand has a better. Um, what's it called? Direction for the game than the one with five bucks. So there's definitely some things to be concerned about as well. Okay, and. So it's basically to do with the development of the game, the DAOs. Is that correct? It's usually, um, yeah, it's usually feature based. Okay. And it's also things like: should we get on to Polygon Chain? Should we start mm -hmm. using Solana? It's like some of the the more fundamental choices are also being made through the DAOs. Okay, that's fine. And you know, when uh, you know. Let's take an example. So you said, you know, they might vote, should we implement multiplayer or should, you know, do you want multiplayer? And then obviously, you know, you guys mm -hmm. go ahead and develop it. So yes, no. If they vote yes, and you, let's say they get the uh, overwhelming majority or yes, so they want multiplier in the game, yeah. like you as the developers, how sort of like wh what sort of procedures do you have in place to say, okay, yes, the users have voted yes, but it might not be feasible right now, or we might have other priorities, you know, mm -hmm. in terms of features. So, or, you know, let's, let's ignore the multiplier. Imagine if there's five new features, you know, the, the feature number two is the one that's voted the highest, but you know, you get into it, you realize for whatever reason, it's not practical right now. And you mm -hmm. deem that maybe features three and four are more practical. What do you do in that sort of scenario? Well, we have to lean a little bit on our own experience from the game industry, right? So um, these votes could be something like, should multiplayer be on the roadmap at all? Uh, instead of just like make multiplayer right now, that's usually not how it goes. Um, it, we can't just like jump out of a feature and get into another thing because it's going to be a lot of... Um, of delays in the regards to when we have to go back to it, we have to relearn. There might be new people on the team. There's a lot of things related to that. So I like to to finish up at least the features we're currently on, um, and the the DAO sort of chooses what's further down on the roadmap. Okay, I mean that does make sense because the last thing you want, like you said, was to be working on a feature and uh, you know very important, uh, and then they vote for something else, probably not that important, and then you just drop things. So, so yeah, having some yeah. sort of systems in place and rules, and, and and like you were saying that you know you're keeping it more broad instead of saying we're going to do multiplayer now. Is it on our roadmap? You know, yes, exactly. for example, uh, you, you brought up another interesting point before that, like somebody might have a lot of money invested, you know, investment in to mm -hmm. the game. And as a result, they all have a higher voting. But like you said, they may not be the best equipped to make the level of decision that their vote, you know, can make. How, mm -hmm. if any, you know, 
you know, sort of rules or procedures do you have in place? And, uh, uh, you know, second to, you know, secondary question to that, do you guys as the developers have like a default stake in, stake in it, like 25%, and that can, you know, be a heavy push? Like, how does that work? Yes, usually the uh, the developer buys in as well, but that's just because we are invested in our own project, right? Um, and it, it, it does make it easier because if... Let's say the developer has 20%, you can sort of push it over the line if there's something that you're really scared of having to do. There's sometimes some um, some pretty crazy things where you're like, this project is going to be endless and it's going to be bloated if we end up adding this feature and that feature, and you can sort of react a little bit to it. Um, but I like to stay out of the votes to keep the players um, in as, as much as possible in charge of what happens. Okay. And these games, which platforms and like consoles or systems are they available on? Uh, Wall Legends is currently on PC. The mobile version will come out pretty soon. Continuum World is in the browser, which works both PC and uh, Mac and, and, and phones. Okay. And the, you know, like the mobile version, you know, what sort of technical, you know, complexities are there when creating a web free you know game like is it all just in the back end and it doesn't really affect you know uh, the apple and android side of things or is there a lot of consideration to be made you know with it's like if you're using a touch screen for example versus a controller there's a lot of des- you know design and technical decisions to be made but like well, ha- ha- how is that in regards to the web free, it's all in the back end. It's not, uh, it's not hosted or related to the Android or Apple um, uh, OSs at all. So that's all good. It's just uh, information that we sent back to the server and so on, and we we handle it from there. There is though some um, on Apple, for example, you currently can't use crypto or NFTs. On Android, you can, you can just you can use NFTs now. They just started opening up for it. So that's pretty awesome. There's been some ways of getting around this um, before, which sort of keeps the NFTs out of the mobile ecosystem where you just uh, sort of um, redirect them to your website if they want to sell off assets and so on. But they can still earn it while playing. Okay. And, you know, what about on the Android side? I mean, that's usually pretty loose, but are there any restrictions on the Android side with this, you know, the web-free technologies? There's restriction on everything, (laughs) (laughs) everywhere. But it is getting better. They're definitely getting better. Some of the things that are sort of helping this is, for example, um, Reddit currently have a... um, nft avatar system and they have i believe they have like 10 million or so of them minted by now which makes it a little more mainstream and the more of these big um, companies we see go mainstream with nfts will make it sort of more normal and will they will realize that this is not necessarily a dangerous thing it is is as dangerous as money it depends on how you use it um so yeah i i, I think we're definitely heading in the right direction to to start opening this up for everybody Okay, that's, you know, interesting. And, you know, a lot of games these days, especially mobile, you know, use the free-to-play model. Is that the model that you guys have chosen for your games? So, um, originally, when when Web3 came out, there was a lot of people who based everything on, um, okay, we'll do like an NFT sale, and then we'll do giveaways of these tokens, and we'll do a lot of things where they're basically giving away their value. And what happens was that a lot of the um, economies... um, got inflation like hardcore so um, for example i worked at a company called voltaire dow which had uh, a very very large investment in axie infinity at the peak of the nft values and i believe we went down by like 96 percent or something value and they had to close the company because they put far too much value into it um so that was pretty rough but that is like um, the early stages. What we're getting to now is a lot more sustainable. People are not using the token in the games in the same way. What happened was that people would give it away. They would reward f- way too much, which caused inflation, uh, like hardcore inflation. What happens now is we're leaning a little bit more into NFT economies, which are um, a lot more 
sustainable, a lot more actionable. You can do things about NFTs in a much nicer way than you can with a token. If a token goes down by 90%, there's not very many, like, there's not a lot of ways to sort of fix this again. If an NFT goes down, then it's just one out of a collection, right? It's not, uh, it's not the whole thing. If you have, um, some mechanics in place for example you can have things like burning mechanics for nfts where you basically destroy them to get something else in war legends we destroy them get dust you can use dust to upgrade other nfts so you're sort of um destroying them upgrading others and putting more focus on others right so what actually happens is that you destroy to to combine into other things right so so that's a very powerful mechanic uh, you can't really destroy the token in the same way um, and then there's mechanics like, for example, let's say you have, um, let's say you have like a, a mystery box with uh, ten NFTs in it. Um, these NFTs each have ten percent chance of dropping. If uh, you add another ten, now the old ones have also have five percent chance. Right? They all have five percent chance, which means you're sort of increasing the rarity of uh, all the NFTs, which also helps with the the value of them. Um, so that's uh, that's another way of sort of helping out on uh, on NFT values. They're just much more flexible and a lot more interesting to to work with. Um, so yeah, that's that's where we're headed now, and it's going to be a much stronger economy going forward. Okay, and you know your games, you know they're web free based, you know using the web free technologies. Do you ever sit there, you, you know, you and your team come up with an idea? and think okay this doesn't really need web3 but we really like the game idea let's run with it or is it a matter of only you know projects that require uh, you know web3 i am only building web3 games that actually get something out of using the web3 mechanics because if they're not then there's no point in doing it right uh, what i want to i came from uh, from the mobile industry mobile games i worked on subway surfers uh, which has like four billion installs or something like that i was on the original team um and um it's a lot of ads. There's a lot of ads in mobile games, and I kind of wanted to do something different. And I thought it was very interesting to see these mechanics and economies in Web3, which are not based on predatory uh, mechanics. It's all about the players playing the game and earning the value and getting something out of it. It's a different way of funding the game studios, where you're not, um, you're not like basically captured by the uh, the investors. You're not forced to do their bidding, kind of thing. So it's just very. It's very, very cool. Um, yeah. Okay. And, you know, the company that you're working for right now, you're, what, the creative director there? I'm chief creative director, yes. Yeah, um, chief, chief creative director. You know, how did you, you know, get that role? Because, you know, you're not that old. You're <laughs> in a chief position at a company. Like, uh What's the sort of steps that you took, and how did you get that role? Yes, let's uh, let's dive into my history. Let's just go from the start. <laughs> so um, let's see. I went to 3D College Denmark for a 3D education. I wanted to do games. I knew from a young age that I wanted to do games, so I put a lot of focus into that. Um, I was there for two years, and I got an internship at uh, Kilu through one of my friends, Tommy, a great friend of mine. Um, I was looking for a job and his boss had one. So I got there, I talked to them, I got the job there. So I got an internship. Um, I was there and I was excited about doing 3D. We had a lead artist and a senior artist and they were there for like a month or two, maybe three before they left. And Tommy and I, both interns, were left with the whole burden of, <laughs> of building the game art all by ourselves. So basically, I was thrown on deep water, like really deep waters. And um, it built a lot of character, having to solve these issues uh, without having a uh, mentor for it. We had to take a lot of responsibility for all the things that we built or didn't uh, make on time. And it just sort of pushed us into this situation where we had to do very, very agile learning. So that has been stuck with me my whole career, and it's been very, very powerful. I've always been uh, on the edge when it comes to like technology, and currently it's like the whole AI thing where I'm also doing quite a lot of things. And um, so there, I built, I believe, eight games with a combined install count on I think four and a half billion or so. 
Um, quite quite a lot of cool games there. Uh, at one point, the company decided uh, to hire a what is that like some kind of financial expert, I suppose, who um, decided to um, that the art team wasn't necessary at the time. So the eight people, me included, I was leading the team with Tommy, and we were all fired. We were let go, and they <laughs> they came back a month later asking us if they we could come back, and we had all found new jobs, right? But I went on to um, to fund a factory where I built, I believe, I worked on seven Snapchat games. Sadly, that pl- platform is not existent anymore. Um, but I also worked on. Um, Bullet League, which is like a, a pretty sweet uh, battle royale for for mobile phones, like a two D um, uh, battle royale, it's really awesome. And then I worked on Software Surfers Tag there as well, which became Apple Arcade Game of the Year. Uh, I believe it was last year. Uh, it was a beautiful game. Um, and I've also in actually in between there, I believe I uh, I that's when we had Mindfuck. So I actually founded a game studio. Sadly, one of the co-founders, one of our <laughs> key pieces, decided that he uh, it wasn't for him. So we had to close that down and, and go find uh, full time jobs again. After uh, after this, um, I was at Voltaire, which I spoke briefly about earlier. Um, at actually let's go one step back here and talk a little bit more about fun day at fun day when i was doing all these snapchat games um it was a two-man team we were doing a full game release every six eight weeks um and it was a programmer and me and i did every single thing that wasn't related to code so i would uh, game design ui uh, 3d art uh, all the balancing and marketing and all these kind of things, all the the visuals, the localization, all these kind of things was uh, was on my table, and uh, yeah, it, it teaches you a lot when you do everything. Um, at that point, I could basically make games from scratch alone. I also code, and also did that in my spare time at that time, which meant I could do uh, full games, right? Which is uh, obviously when you say you can do full games, so there's a limit to it as you're a single person and you don't have a million hours a day, right? So it will take forever to build anything, so it's much more powerful to be in a team. But this knowledge of knowing how every single aspect of game development works has been incredibly powerful uh, for managing teams afterwards. Um, I was at Voltaire. I was uh, giving a large budget and told I could build my own team. So I found people at um, from Riot and Blizzard and like so on. Build my team around that. Sadly, we had to to stop that. But I was a creative director there, managing the the game project, which was like a an MMO um, with a proper scope. So no, nothing too absolutely insane, but it was still a bit big project, right? And then from there, I uh, basically through networking, I, I jumped into another position because I uh, convinced the boss at Playchain that I could do this job, and it turns out I can. So that was uh, that was beautiful. I, all the concerns he had, I was able to to tell that I've dealt with this and talk about how I've dealt with it before um, back from like all my experiences with all these different cases. I've been in the games industry for around 13 years now. I have about 20, I think I have 23 release titles. Yes, 23 release titles, um, which is a lot of experience in releasing games. A lot of people are on projects for like three years and being through this, uh, the whole mill on on the mobile side is uh, has been very, very powerful. Um, actually, releasing games is is like one of the the most, I suppose, um, best teaching moments in game development because it is by then that you have to have something that actually works, right? Um, a lot of projects die before then, sadly. Oh, yeah, but I've released twenty. Yeah, sorry. You yeah, go. I was supposed to say yeah. I mean, a lot of projects do die, and like the other thing, you know, I you know being you know I did computer game programming at university, and having released you know games myself, I like doing it from you know the idea all the way to release is totally different to just doing one aspect of it because you know I remember when I used to talk to friends that had never done the whole process before and they're, mm-hmm. they're like especially like let's say a programmer 
and they'll be like, oh yeah, that's easy. You just go to programming. It's just like there's so many other aspects. Even once you got the game, you know, built, you know, you go to upload it on Apple, and Apple's like, you know, <laughs> gives you an error, and you don't, and and like the errors, especially back then when it was in the early days uh, when I was doing it, literally when the app stores, you know, first came out, like the errors are so generic. And sometimes it's because the icon hasn't been named correctly according to their yep. new, you know, rules. Like something as silly as that. And it's it's just one of those things that you just don't appreciate until you actually do the full process. And obviously you've gone through the full process and, mm-hmm. you know, you've done the artist, you've done the programming side. But I'll let you finish your train of thought and then I do have a question for you. No, yes, definitely. Uh, but in regards to this, like I think making the game is half the process of making a game, which sounds weird, but it, it's, <laughs> it it's, it's true. Um, there's so many aspects to it that you have to consider. Like even when you're working with like ad systems, you don't expect this to be a big deal. But the the amount of um, like analytics and so on you get back from it, and the amount of testing that you need to do to perfect these is just massive. It's a massive task. There's a reason why this is like the full department at all the the big mobile game studios, right? There's like 20, 30 people just doing that. Um, so yeah, massive, massive amounts of stuff around games. That's not actually the game. Um, yeah. Oh yeah. The Like you said, like, you know, looking into ad networks, you know, looking into some sort of in-app purchase models as well and the APIs, you know, all that sort of stuff. And, you know, you see some framework and you're thinking, oh, you know, I'm going to use this. This looks so good. And it could be like the, you know, the industry leading framework. You go on there and the, there's like no documentation or there's hardly any documentation or mm-hmm. it's like made in, you know, from someone in China and they got some outdated documentation in Chinese. And it's like, like, what the hell am I even doing here? Like, it's it, it sounds crazy. Like, people listening to this, uh, if, if they're not within this industry, if they haven't made these sort of products from scratch, they're probably thinking, you know, once you've got the game up, you just whack an ad banner in there. You're done. Mm-hmm. But, like, <laughs> so sometimes it's not that simple. Or you whack it in there, and you're like, is it working? Is is it not working? Like, you know, it, it's te- like, well, you know, what's happening? Like, sometimes it doesn't appear straight away, you know what is actually you know like what's going on because you don't want to release it uh you know onto the app store especially with apple where you know you have to go through a verification process again uh, you know mm-hmm. on android you know, obviously you don't want to release a buggy you know game update but if you do you can just get another one on there very quickly and just get propagated with apple you could be waiting two three weeks in the queue and yes, exactly. if they end up rejecting your next update for something silly, you could be waiting another two, three weeks in the queue. Yeah, that is that is absolutely insane, right? There's um, yeah, and there's nothing worse than sitting there waiting for the queue to to like waiting for a build that's functional to go through while something is live that is super buggy or has something game breaking, right? That is the worst feeling as a developer releasing something that's not perfect. So that's why we always strive to do that. And we have a lot of testing and QA periods, right, to, to do these kind of things. In regards to, to the ad spend and so on, that reminds me that there's like a whole marketing side to this, which is, is pretty wild, at least in, in mobile games. Um, let's see, something people can find a little more tangible if they're not in games could be, for example, the Barbie movie cost, I believe it was $240 million to, to produce. And they spent two hundred and forty-five million dollars on marketing, which is actually more than the, the 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 movie itself, right? If you go to games, all the big game studios like Sunga, Rovio, and so on, they always have between twenty and forty uh, million dollars out in user acquisition uh, companies at all times. Which is uh, you got to have pretty deep buckets to do this. But that is if you're if you are trying to force a game to become a success, you need to do that. And you're competing with those guys when you're releasing it alone from your basement. It's uh, it's pretty tough out there. Oh, yeah. I mean, like, it's the problem with the App Store. And because I remember when it first came out in 08, and there was that promise of, you know, it's going to be, you know, a platform for indie developers to be able to release their, you know, games, their applications, and not, you know, have to deal with the likes of, PlayStation, Xbox, Nintendo, mm-hmm. and then obviously the you know, studios as well. 
and for a brief period of time it was if you release something half didn't it have to be amazing something half decent you know and then free to play wasn't even a model like you released it you know charge a dollar you know you will start getting you know downloads but then the big boys you know started looking and they're like you know what this this is the, this platform looking pretty nice. Those games mm-hmm. that people are making, they don't look that difficult to make. We can bang them out pretty quickly. We've already got existing franchises. Let's just whack Tetris on there. Let's whack a dumbed down version of whatever you know pre existing franchise they got on there. But instead of charging dollar, they'll charge three, four, five dollars, and they'll get the sale. So they come in, and then on top of that, the few indie developers that were there and you know was able to go against them they they've ended up becoming the you know the behemoths you know the yeah. monsters of the industry and and right now if you are an indie developer and you are trying to release a game or an application it doesn't matter whether it's a game or an app or especially a game i'd say on android or ios it is ridiculously difficult you go on there you're either seeing one of the old guard companies or you're seeing one of the newer mobile, you know, you know, monsters, but you know, like they're just like pumping out the games and they're just like reskinning games as well. So it's, it's just become, it's just got to a point where unfortunately it's just the same as it's always been. Yeah. The barrier to entry is low, but to get it into any sort of meaningful position within the app store is so difficult. Yeah, exactly. That's also why it's so celebrated every time we hear about these, um, one or two free man teams that have yes. great success because it's so rare it's very very hard to do without a budget for for user acquisition and marketing it's a massive part of game development currently and it's just how it is yeah uh, i mean and that you know leads me on to like an interesting question so is play chain bootstrapped uh, you know did they raise funding you know what's the situation there plus the other company that you worked for as well was it voted uh dao to you know like obviously i know they're no longer around but yeah. you know what was their situation in terms of bootstrapping and raising funds that was uh that was all uh with raised funds yeah both of them okay and play chain as well yeah exactly and play chain as well okay and then we're racing for the game separately as well on the side Okay, so 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 you raise for the overall company to build out yeah, the company exactly. employees or offices if you have offices, and then for each game as well. And mm-hmm. you know, like raising money isn't easy. Did nope. you know the founders of these companies were they you know had they already done something that allowed them to you know raise funds easier? What was the situation with them? Was it the first time? So um, for Voltaire. It, actually, for both of them, it was uh, it was serial entrepreneurs who uh, who raised money for them. I think I've done over like two hundred pitches over the last year. Um, in the start, it was super nerve wracking, and then it just becomes like every day kind of thing. Uh, it's been very, very, um, very powerful to get so many no's. To be honest, it's uh, it's it's it strengthens you quite a lot. Uh, it's tough to go through in the start, but then at some point you sort of like start getting like um, you don't get the same reaction to it late on which has been very very nice because then you're sort of learning from it right and you understand the environment and it's just having a whole um whole different view on the game industry in general and like how every single aspect of game development works because when you're sitting at the table and you're pitching these games it does not matter if that button is blue green or it has the round edges or whatever as might have been my concern a few years ago and probably still is the concern of the people on my teams right um but you start to understand like the um what what would you call that like the um the upper level of why games succeed, why they don't, what what can actually find um, funding, and what are people looking for? And it's just uh, it's very very interesting to get the uh, get the priorities straight. Okay, and like you said that you do, you know, a lot of meetings still for raising funds. Is that yeah. for pre existing games? Like you're constantly raising funds to be able to, you know, build out more features, or is it for new games like you know what's the need for you know constantly still raising funds 
So I want to expand my teams. Um, I have now proven that the games are great games. We've gotten good numbers on them, nice traction. Now I'm looking for uh, for funding to, to expand the team and go to the next level. Um, it is much harder to, to raise for a game where there's no... Um, like no proof that this will work. It's all basically based on what is our experience? Do we know how to build games and so on? But now we can actually show real numbers, something tangible, which the investors can then look at and be like, okay, so if I put this in, it'll be so and so long before we see a really good return on that. So um, yeah, definitely very interesting. Okay, and what sort of you know numbers are we talking about with some of these games? Like, uh, What are the most successful games of play chain so um i believe contenium world has raised a little above two million uh dollars which is really nice that means that we can have a decent sized team for quite a while nice runway and so on which is yeah that's beautiful um a lot of this though was raised when there was a hardcore bull market on the on uh, on crypto which is it makes it much more harder today. Today you need to to have a game. You need to prove what it is. Back then you could basically just show up with like a concept, an idea, and show your show your history of game development. Um, so yeah, that's that's awesome. But it gives us a little bit of safety in this uh, this uh, harder time. Okay, and you know, on the other side of things, you know, what sort of numbers? Are we talking about in terms of like players or downloads for you know for the most popular games? Um, okay, so let's see. So some of the things that happened is like uh, War Legends, for example, had a tournament with eighteen guilds in Web Three. Guilds are massive gatherings of people who try and work together to make money in the in the games. Um, and that came out to I actually don't remember, but it was quite quite a lot of people were participating trying to get into these kind of things. Um, but I believe the player base is like two to five thousand daily players kind of thing between the games. Sadly, it's not the uh, the thirty millions we had in Subware Surfers, but it's uh, it's definitely building every day. Okay, yeah. Plus, obviously, in a web free, you know, it doesn't have the same sort of, you know, reach right now as some of the more conventional games yes, exactly. studios. So, we're, you know, they're not. We're not on Steam. Yeah. We're not on Epic Games. Like, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of barriers to entry, which are pretty rough. But also early, right? But uh, we'll uh, we'll keep uh, keep building. Yeah, I mean, so, so so you mentioned Ep- Epic Games and you know Steam. You know why aren't you on those platforms? Uh, and of a follow-up question: Are there any restrictions, f- you know, on those platforms like you know Apple around crypto and blockchain, or is it yeah. a matter of it's in the back end and it doesn't matter? So uh, Steam doesn't allow crypto games, anything related to crypto. And uh, we are in the approval process for for Epic Games that should go through pretty soon. We're pretty excited about it because it should build the player base quite a bit. Okay, so so talk about Epic and you know Steam. You know, what's your opinion on Valve, Steam, and then obviously you know what Epic is doing, trying to be you know different. You know, they're giving a lot. They're giving like one monthly you know games away for free, and you know they're, they're trying to do you know, a lot to, you know, stand out. So uh, Steam is basically playing it safe, which I totally get. They have a massive business, they have the foothold, they have everything they need to to sustain for a very long time. And they already have a massive, massive catalog of games. Um, so I don't think they should necessarily be worried, but they are cracking down on things like AI-generated content. They're cracking down on NFTs. Um but they're allowing like very porn-ish games, which is like a strange combo. And then um, Epic is a little bit like Wild Gun. They're pushing all the fronts to get do everything they can to make sure that they are uh, ready for any situation going forward. So that means that if there is something related to NFTs that becomes a major hit, they're now ready for it because they're allowing it. I know they have a big partnership with uh, Immutable X, for example, or Immutable, which is doing some of the biggest uh, web free games. Um, so they're definitely ready for that. But they're also 
a massive money machine, right? Like what they're making their money off is not necessarily the games. I believe it's more into the uh, to the Unreal game engine, right? So they they have a lot of funding yeah. from elsewhere that they can push into trying to take a big. Uh, uh, slice of the pie in, in this market and they did push through like a lot of it came from um fortnite right and then yeah, people huge just sort of like, stuck i would yeah, exactly. say that's probably their biggest cash cow. obviously i haven't seen their books but i would say that's probably their single biggest cash cow is fortnite and that it's crazy to you know if you know for people that know the history of Epic and the sort of games, you know, they used to make. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, like how hardcore effectively it was. And, you know, the you know, form that came from them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That is that is pretty interesting. I played um, Fortnite back when it was like just a base building game before the uh, Battle Royale came out. And it was, uh, it was okay and so on. But the, the, the Battle Royale is just... Uh, so so powerful it was fun to see in the start like the way they were doing it because they were doing it very casually in the start they're just taking mechanics from another part of the game and they were sort of rebranding into this uh this thing because fortnite originally wasn't what we think of fortnite as today it was uh it was a defense game you build a base and you protect yourself against zombies and now it's just a, a battle royale right um so that that was pretty interesting to to sort of follow their process in learning. Okay, maybe our original idea doesn't have the amount of uses that we want, and then we're testing out a few game modes, and then one of them becomes super successful, and they put all the resources into that, right? So they put all the resources into the battle royale, and it seems to have paid off greatly. Mm. Oh yeah, like for for them, Fortnite has it's gone insane, like. Uh... I don't think there's any, you know, teenager or kid that is heavily into gaming that hasn't at one point played Fortnite or doesn't already play Fortnite. It's like every kid that I come across is just like Fortnite, 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 or maybe like Roblox, for example. Like the, there's those yeah. few games now. It's like when I was a kid, Call of Duty, FIFA. I know those games are still big, but like the what they were then for my generation. You know, I, I, you know, you got mm-hmm. Roblox, you got Fortnite, and some other games as well. It's, you know, it's really become you know big for Epic, and yeah, I mean they're doing really well with it. You know, obviously kudos to them for trying something new outside of you know what's it called, you know, Unreal Tournament, and you know those you know typical games you know for them. Obviously, as someone that's not fussed by Fortnite, I. It, it does kind of, you know, upset me that we're going to less likely to see a new Unreal Tournament or, you know, one of the, their old school games just from the start, just because, you know, Fortnite's doing so well and they're going to focus less on those other games, you know, that they used to, uh, you know, the sort of games that I, you know, love. But again, that's just the way the industry is and things change and then there's other game studios that come out and are like their game so it's it is just one of those things that's very true but uh just like it's those behemoths right the numbers are basically what decides where they go and the gamer types i don't know if you remember when we grew up the games were very very hardcore i tried playing some of them not long ago and it's (laughs) it's pretty intense the player base has become used to getting the dopamine fix faster they have more slight uh, like casual games i would say the puzzles are not as hard you can do a lot of things just by googling it right we couldn't google it when we grew up there's like there's a lot of things that um just i think that just less attention span which means it has to be success 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 all the time right um so it, the the player base is currently different from what it was um, like 20, 20 years ago kind of thing. And it means that the the game studios have to focus in a different place if they want to make money. And that just also means that games like, for example, let's see, Star Trek 2, um, oh, sorry, StarCraft, for example, is is one of those games that we probably won't see a third one for just because it's too, it's too hardcore. Uh, it's unlikely that they will make a lot of money back from that. They did somehow manage to make some money back from uh, from Diablo Four, which I'm pretty impressed by. Yeah. Um, but then there's also some of the games like making the most money in the world are some of the casual mobile games that 
like we just think of as small little titles. Clash of Clans. Yeah, exactly. They're making like you see the number, like if you go on like yeah. what a uh, social blade, you know, you see, and think gaming, like you see the numbers that they're doing, and you're just like, like what the hell? Like per day, exactly. per month, per exactly. year. The um, the thing is though that not everybody has a PC, but every single person on this planet almost has a phone, right? Mm-hmm. Like at least in the in the in the first second world kind of thing. Like all the the kids have them, and they play games all the time. And it's a fact that when you make games, you get ten times the player base when you're on mobile. So if you have a a way of of transferring your PC game to to mobile, you'll most likely see great success from doing so. Um, I know there's a lot of hate from uh, PC game developers at times to for the for the mobile games because it's like oh it's casual it's boring it doesn't work the gameplay is not fun on mobile and so on but the, the fact is that we have a generation that grows up with this right now this is their preferred means of gaming um, and if you want to make money you should probably reach them there and not try and force them into something they're not comfortable with or can't even access. Um, so yeah, there's there's a lot to that, but then there will always be mobile games, right? And that I think that Steam is currently also the place where if you're an indie developer, this is definitely where you should release. Oh yeah, like, yeah, it depends on what sort of game you're making, you know, what you want to do. Like obviously you've got to, you know, make that consideration that okay, if I'm not going to be on mobile, if I'm not mm. going to make something casual, um I am restricting my audience, but I or if it's decent and I can get traction, I can charge five, ten, twenty dollars for it, and people will pay for it. Whereas on mobile, you're not charging five, ten, twenty dollars. Like, like the, the only games that might be able to get five bucks out to anyone is like if Rockstar, you know, when they release like Max Payne or GTA, it's a pre existing mm-hmm. game people have fond memories of, and you know, they remember paying thirty, forty dollars. Now they're like, okay, I'll get four pay five dollars i get gta free i get vice city i get san andreas it's on my phone and you know i can play it you know when i'm on the train you know when i'm bored compared to you know having to have some sort of portable console with you so yeah like the average game isn't going to be able to charge us so yeah there's definitely you know that side of it and i think you make an interesting point it is like I, I understand the point that a lot of these PC developers or even console develop, you know, you know, conventional game developers, you know, are making. But again, you've got to, you know, think about it and see, you know, what works best. And if you're at a size where you've got traction, you know, you've got, you know, good cash flow. I think one of the smart decisions is to do a mobile push. Do let's say a web free push, get the cash cows if you can, and then use part of that to fund the games that probably won't make as much money, but you might you know enjoy more. Yes, most definitely. I think that is uh, the right approach, right? There's um, my my only thing is just that people should at least keep their like mind open for going into mobile take a look at it see if it's feasible some games are obviously not feasible on mobile i i agree things like uh, fps games it is simply not the same um but then again i wouldn't play fps games on a console and it's a great success across many games um so there's there's different ways that people see these things right uh, but there's a generation growing up who prefers mobile across all different game genres so it's just about figuring out how do the controls work and is this is this possible? Um, and obviously, you should only build things that you like. So if you don't don't like your mobile version, you probably shouldn't release it. Um, yeah, so that that's a massive, massive thing. But when you say um, the only the big ones can sell their games for five bucks, that's completely true. The thing is that the amount of people in these games makes it like so you don't have to make a lot of money off your players for the for the game to make a lot of money for example software surfers has uh, that i worked on originally has um like 4 billion installs right and it has 30 million daily users you don't need to show a lot of ads per user for this to work out really really well um so yeah there's definitely some different things there to consider yeah. oh yeah for sure so yeah that company that you worked at where they had you know 4 billion installs 30 million daily active users like you know what were their most popular games 
that's Subway Surfers on mobile. Yeah, like, I mean, the, the what were the jumping. most popular games that they had or do have? Uh, Subway Surfers. Oh, okay. So, so, so. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, it's like a, uh, a lane-based game where you have to jump between trains. Uh, I, I, I thought that was like my bad. I thought that was a studio. So is that four billion? Oh, Subway Surfers. Sorry. So yes, uh, yes. Uh, I thought you were saying strange. something like software service. And ah, yeah, okay. Yeah, so, so subway surfers. You know, when you when you just explained like jump between trains, I was like, I've heard of a game like that before. <laughs> like, yeah, I remember playing subway. So yes, they had a lot. Of, uh, is that what they're at now? Four billion downloads. Yeah, which is insane. Uh, like, well, what insane. just for subway surfers or some of the sort of you know other titles as well. I think that is the only one that really matters because even if a game has 100 million downloads, it's nothing compared to this beast. Yeah, Jesus. Yeah, Subway Surfers is, again, yeah, a very casual <laughs> game. And then obviously, do you remember yeah. the game Temple Run? You know, kind of a similar yes. style? Yeah, we, we based some of the mechanics on that. That's like an interesting thing about game development as well. Like maybe we should get into that, how it's very, very hard to come up with something completely original now. Everything seems to be a mix of other things. Um, so it's about finding the right combination and trying to to do a little bit of innovation, but make sure people understand what's going on and keep a lot of what's uh, what they already know. Oh, yeah, because, you know, if people are downloading your game for free, there's very little keeping them there, uh, you know. Yeah. So, so, so if you cannot hook them quickly, so if you've got some new, I want to even say convoluted, but if you've got some new game mechanics that take, you know, 20 minutes to understand, you know, you've got yeah. to play a few times and die, like people ain't are not, uh, they don't want to play that. Whereas in the old days, when you were spend $30, $40 on a console or PC game, you spend that, you know, ignoring piracy, you know, piracy aside, you know, you spent that money, even if it's rubbish. I remember as a kid, you know, getting games, like obviously trying to get, you know, the money from my parents to buy the games. You know, it's not always the easiest thing where like, you, you know, you should I get this game, should I get that game? Like, even if I got a game and it wasn't the best, I played it a few times. <laughs> like, there, there was never that thing, oh, it's rubbish. I'm going to put it down. It's like, oh, I'm playing it. it I'm g-. And even up to the point where early on when I was making my own money and like still $30, $40 meant a lot more to me, you know, than it does now, I would mm-hmm. get a game and be like, it's not the best, but I'm so I'm completing it. Like I am making it my mission to complete it. Now, you know, it's obviously I'm older. I have, you know, I'm busy with work, busy with family. So there's an element of that, but also an element of $30, $40 isn't that much to me as it used to be. And oh, yes. Yeah, so, so I'm like, uh, it's not the best. You know, what am I going to do? Uh, I, I'd rather not play it. I, I'd rather not spend, like, and that happened in Assassin's Creed Valhalla. And I didn't buy that. I borrowed it off my cousin. I had just finished Ghost of Tsushima. You know, mm-hmm. you know, amazing game. One of the most beautiful games that I've ever played. And the gameplay, the story, amazing. And you know, similar sort of style. It's there's combat. It's you know, open world. You know, you can do a bit of climbing. So you know, there's a lot of similarities there. And I think Ghost of Tsushima had probably about thirty or so hours, twenty five, thirty hours. Maybe a bit more because I did platinum it as well, but around about then. And then afterwards, I borrowed Assassin's Creed. I was like, you know, I'm up. Uh, I was enjoying this open world game. If finished, let me go into another open world game. Borrowed it off my cousin, started playing it, and I was like, this is just so bad. The, like the Assassin's Creed games <laughs> have gone downhill recently, but I was like, this is just so so bad. And he just got to like. I thought, you know, let me give you some time. I gave you like two or three hours. And I was like, this is not getting any better. And then I had to look how long the game is. I think you're like 60, 70 or 50. Like a, a lot of hours just for the core, you know, story. Mm-hmm. And then full completion was significantly more than 100 hours. And I thought, I am not sinking my, you know, teeth into this. And even if I had paid for it, I probably would have had a similar thought. And I remember I said to my cousin, uh, you know, I'm not interested. I don't want to play it anymore. You know, you know, you can have it back next time you see it. He was, he, he said, "I thought it was rubbish. You keep it. You just keep it on your shelf." <laughs> <laughs> like he didn't want it back, and he paid for it. It's oh, still wow, on that's shelf. amazing. 
that's a uh, that's a thing though like the the pay for it uh, paying for it and so on is like we also have like you said there's a lot of games you wouldn't pay for when you're younger because the money is mean more to you uh, the money makes means more to you or you have less of it or you don't have any um but you do have time and it is possible to play for some of, or pay for some of these games through ads right so what happens is that you sort of trade your time instead of trading your money to play the game Oh yeah, uh, yeah. It's it's one of those things. Like when I see kids now, and it, because because I remember how how it was when I was a kid. I would come back from school, get my school work done, and you know, outside of eating, going to toilet, and sleeping, the rest of the hours was just me on the computer. And a l- big chunk of that time was playing games. I know if I was a kid today, the mobile games, I would sink you know a lot of hours into it. I'll sink a lot of hours into. Many games that I generally do not play, you know, nowadays. And it's obviously the same principle with the kids today. You know, they'll play these games. They'll sing 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, even 100 hours into some of these mobile games. And then the next time I'll see them, they'll be playing something else. And they'll be really high ranking. And then the next time they're playing something else. And it is just how it was for me. But I was playing games that cost $30, $40 at a time. And but they're just downloading the latest game that's on the app store, you know, playing it a lot. And if they really like it, it stays on their phone, and mm-hmm. you know they, you know, they continuously go back to it, even if they play another game. It's kind of interesting. Like uh, I, I'm a PC gamer, right? That's like how I grew up. But I'm getting a little more into mobile, and I'm f- because the experience is getting better, the controls are getting better, everything is is sort of getting better about it. But there is one game which I did not expect, which I prefer the mobile version to the the PT, uh, PC version. Halfstone. I feel like it plays better on mobile. Everything just feels nicer. It's uh, it's kind of strange, but it also means that I can bring it with me wherever I want and so on. Like uh, which. Yeah, it's it's just my preferred way of playing Hearthstone, which I did not expect that I would have that uh, with a game, preferring the mobile version uh, over the the PC one. Oh yeah, like you know, a game like Hearthstone, you know, when you see it, you like, yeah, that just works well on mobile. That just works well on like a tablet. It is just, mm-hmm. a, you know, it's just a you know deal. Obviously, something like that you probably wouldn't want on a console with like a controller mouse you know makes more sense but then having a screen they can just tap and yeah. yeah like there are like i said there are some games that yeah were on you know pc initially but they just work so well on you know a mobile device so it's not just a matter mm-hmm. of creating a new you know game or application so, you know there'll be existing ones that just did well but then they do even better you know they feel even better on you know the mobile you know platforms but like you know what's the sort of design decisions and considerations you make you know with the smaller devices like phones not that small anymore you know they are pretty big but like compared to a tablet and because obviously a tablet is not getting the same level of users in your game as a typical phone will so the difference between not just different considerations You, you know like the the design considerations and you know a, you know anything you know you know when you're developing a game you know because you got those two big you know platforms mobile yeah. uh, mobile I mean like you know like phones and then like in, tablets in well. general they're very close to each other the thing is though that mobile has this thing where you can play a lot of games with a single hand um, and you can't just use the same aspects and the same layouts and so on if you put it on a on a uh, tablet because obviously you can't play one handed on a tablet where you're holding the tablet at the same time. So that's that's one thing. So that's where I would sort of cater games more towards using both hands on tablet and using one hand on mobile. But the aspect ratio is almost the same on tablet. Usually things just look a little nicer. Um, at times it's actually worse because you're optimizing or um, improving, sorry, what's that called? Reducing the size of the graphics so much that it actually looks better on the phone than it does on the tablet. But that's like all the considerations that you have to do there, right? You have to figure out what, what actually works. Um, I've seen a lot of developers that just release on both without, <laughs> where it's pretty clear. You didn't test this on a tablet, for example. Um, 
and the other way around because it's there's just some aspects to it where it's like okay this makes no sense because of the distance between where i'm holding or the like my finger is clearly not long enough for this and, and things like that oh yeah like obviously you gotta ideally you know have something to cater towards you know the two different platforms and you're right on mobile a lot of the time you'll play games and there'll be one hand, you know, like Subway, take Subway Surfer, for example. You can yep. play that one hand, but obviously on tablet, even if you got the same game mechanic in there of the swiping and the jumping, just because of how big it is, you've got to hold it with one. Uh, yep. you know, at best, you might be able to, depending on what you're doing at that moment, at best you might be kind of balancing on your knees or your legs, for example. But, mm-hmm. you know, you're probably going to be holding it with one and then swiping, you know, with your other hand as well. So, yeah, you, you know, you do have those, you know, design decisions. And, and, you know, I've noticed that in games as well. You were saying that on tablet, even though technically it should look a little crisper, a little better, a little nicer, sometimes mm-hmm. it just doesn't, especially with the big games, the ones that have, you know, a lot of money, a lot of cash flow coming in, they yeah. look worse because they're just using the same assets that they're, using that the mobile they're on version. mobile or, or on phone. <laughs> And they just get like candy crush. You know, you 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 look at that on like an iPad Pro. You look at that on your phone, and you're just like, they're just using the same assets. They've scaled it up. Still looks, you know, looks good enough, but you can tell. Yeah, and that's a shame because it's not that big of a deal. You can uh, you can detect what platform you're on, and then get the custom assets for that. It's not, uh, yeah, it's not rocket science. No, it isn't. So you know, to talk about you know platforms, obviously with mobile games it's you know size is very important you know you want to try mm-hmm. and get it as small as possible it's more important than on a console it's more important than on a pc you know what sort of you know size for most games would you say is the max i can't remember if they changed the cap but it was basically at 100 uh so there, there was like a um um the switch between if you can use your mobile network or you have to use Wi-Fi was 100 megabytes, which meant that you really strive to get under 100 megabytes so that people can download it anywhere so they don't have to be on Wi-Fi to do so because it's a massive barrier to entry, right? So that was sort of the, that's the thing you were, we were aiming for for quite a while. I can't remember if they changed it lately though. Okay. But I mean, how about just, you know, Ideally, you know, ignoring technical limitations like that, and you know, you know, barriers that the you know the manufacturers are putting on, you know, the downloading. Because you know, if let's say you've got you know Flappy Bird, for example, obviously that got taken down. But like you know, if Flappy Bird was a hundred meg, I don't think that would do as well as what it was, which was I think just a few meg. Like you know, what is that sort of you know? size you would say is unless it's super huge you want to be below we're not actually seeing that big a difference between 10 megabytes and 2 gigs really so so if a game is a 2 gig download versus a 10 20 meg download even on a mobile using a mobile network and not wi-fi people are still willing to download it yeah, I, I don't think the difference is big enough for people to really put it take it into consideration. The thing is also that the massive games, like the two gig games, are usually like IPs that have been going on forever, right? So people are also, I suppose, expecting a little more, mm-hmm. and therefore it's okay that it takes longer. Whereas if it's not the prettiest game in the world and it's 10 megabytes, you, yeah. I think that's like a thing there. I'm not completely sure what the psychology is behind it, but the the difference in the numbers is not massive. The 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 main thing is that can they download on their mobile network or do they need Wi-Fi? Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. But yeah, yeah. Also, I mean, like I'm on a two gig uh, gigabit connection right now. So if my phone is on my Wi-Fi, basically everything's instant, and it's just yeah. Yeah, it's, I mean, it doesn't matter much. Yeah, definitely, it's you know if it's from an existing studio existing ip i know myself personally you're willing to you know wait you look like you know you know i know that ip you know i really want to play the new need for speed game the new yeah. call of duty game and you know it's just like on consoles i'll download a hundred 
a 50 or 150 gig update for Call of Duty. But I'll tell you what, I'm not doing that for some game I've never heard of or never played. Exactly. <laughs> so, so, yeah, there definitely is a huge you know, element of that. It's just like when you look at movies, a Marvel movie on launch, you know, you know, on a midnight launch, is going to get more, you know, a bigger queue than some random superhero movie that nobody's ever heard of. Mm-hmm. There's also another element, which is um, the games are usually free to play on mobile, which means that you can go in, you can press download, and you can go back and browse for more games. So you're not really spending time waiting. You're just like checking other stuff out, and then at some point they'll be done, and you'll start playing some. But people tend to to actually pick up like a few games at a time. Yes, I know I've done that before. I've gone on there. And again, it's like that thing. Oh, you know, it's going to take a few minutes based on my connection. I'll see what else there is. And yeah. if there's something else that might be a bit smaller, and I can get it a little quicker. And then I'll get round to that other one you know, afterwards. And then you just end up like the five minutes, five, ten minutes that you're waiting for your game to download, thinking that, okay, I'll download something else. You're just downloading a bunch of other games, you know, yep. as well. So, yeah, the... Uh, I know I've done that, you know, myself as well. So, yeah, there's definitely an element of that. So, you know, with, you know, making these games, these web-free games, you know, what sort of tech stack are we, you know, talking about, you know, you know, going on a more technical level? Like, what differences are we talking about when you're making it compared to a regular Web2 game? So, it's it's very similar in the sense that you we use, like... Um... We have Unity for some games, Unreal for others, Goda for something. Um, but it's basically the same thing. And then there's an extra layer of solidity, which is the blockchain uh, scripting itself, like the contracts, the smart contracts for things like uh, Ethereum and, uh, and Polygon and so on. Um, but those are usually... Uh, it's like having a normal game team, and then you add an extra person or two who can handle the <laughs> the 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 web free um, blockchain related uh, things and the creation of nfts and the the burning and the contracts for that they're no, not super super complex they can be obviously but they're not necessarily super complex for games which means that it's fairly easy to tie these two things together um it works a bit like a uh, a database which we basically can't change <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fair enough. So, like, you know, you mentioned that you used Unreal for some games, Unity for some, GoDap for some. You know, yeah. like, why the different ones instead of just choosing, you know, one of them? You know, like, what advantages are there over one over the other? And which one would you recommend? If somebody said you have to pick the one, which one would you recommend having used those? So, I... um would like to use the one which the team has the most experience with. This is because they are very equal in so many ways. Uh, Unreal is slightly better for some FPS situations. Um, Both of them have a ton of things like um, customization. You could basically build anything with all of them. Um, So at the end of the day, uh, my team has double the experience in Unreal, I would put them in Unreal if they have double the experience in Unity and it's more about their preference and making sure they're comfortable than it is me picking an engine for one of the other reason because I don't think there's necessarily that big a difference between them anymore. Okay. And, you know, you mentioned that, you know, your background is, you know, being a designer, being an artist, and mm-hmm. then you, you know, learned a bunch of the different aspects of, you know, creating a game, running a business, including yep. being a programmer. You know, how did you find being a programmer to, you know, obviously this long standing experience as an artist? Um, I've been a technical artist pretty early on, which meant I had a lot of uses for programming. Um, but I am very um, efficiency oriented, which meant uh, all my programming time and so on, a lot of it at least, went into like optimizing pipeline, making sure that the 3D and the, the 2D assets came out on a click instead of 100, um, which has been super, super helpful. Um, I like things like some of my favorite things in the world is like procedurally generated content. It's doing item systems and uh, like 
dungeon crawlers basically where it's like all about the loot it's about the the abilities of the bosses and the mechanics and the hidden treasures and so on i love that aspect and i think my programming basically appeared when i had all the art but i didn't have a game and i started building my own little things for that um so i have found that it's obviously it's much better to have focus like if you're a programmer you should like stick to programming but when it comes to like a management uh perspective i think it's incredibly valuable to have every single aspect of uh, uh of game development in your experience yeah i mean i understand what you mean you've got to you know have a focus and it does help you know let's say if you're programming it does help to understand the art side of things you you know mm-hmm. help to understand you know this is a tool they're using to export the models the images this is you know the complexity around you know doing it one way versus another way and you know like work with that side of the business that side of the you know making games to figure out you know what's the best approach for you but what's also the best you know approach for them so you know mm-hmm. you know figuring you know that out. but you mentioned you mentioned procedurally generated content you know oh, how yes. do you ensure quality control for procedurally generated content because that can easily get you know to a point where it's yeah you know it's generated on the fly but they don't mm-hmm. have much substance and it just feels like empty you know it just feels like it wasn't made by someone so the whole thing here is how deep should the procedural generation itself go? Like you could do something super basic with pre-made tiles and it puts them in a random, like, um, what's it called? Random uh, order, right? But you could also do tiles where there's procedurally generated content within them. So you do, let's say you do a dungeon and um, you have now generated a room and is the stuff inside the room pre-made or is that all random or procedure generated is all the enemies generated and so on you can go in depth right at some point it just becomes very generic and not um not supporting the whole game or the direction you are looking for because you don't actually know what happens if there's too many elements that can be be generated right um so you can control it sort of like that by making sure that the chunks are in your control and you have to make sure that you don't procedurally generate just to procedurally generate um at some point you have to see is this too deep into the to the details does it matter if it's a cup or a plate that's on the table does it really do you really want to randomize between these two um it's it's more about does it support the the game um let's let's say diablo for example i think it was the second one they had like the hubs all the main points were static and then the content in between it was sort of random actually all the dungeons were pre-made in diablo 2 it just sounded or looked random uh, but in the third one that you had like hubs and uh, special points that were, were were static and then the content in between them was sort of the generator right and i think that level is is good so you make sure that you keep your story you make sure that you keep everything in in a nice way but then you have ones where it's procedurally generated in much more depth like uh, minecraft for example this is super fascinating to me but it feels a little bit more like a social experiment than a in a game right it's it's hard it's really hard to do something like minecraft we generate a full world and do it story driven it's possible because you could just force it to put story point one two and three and four in somewhere but it, it, it's it's harder to control right um but it's kind of nice what i think what i like about it is building a game where i as the developers don't know what will happen <laughs> i think that has like uh, some charm to it oh yeah yeah i mean uh I spoke to a bunch of people about this and you know you're right it depends on what level you know to you're talking about because nowadays when you hear about procedural co- you know content it, you know it, there's a tendency to say okay you know we'll just make the whole game procedural or yeah. the vast majority of it but but like I said, you know there's levels to it it can just be a matter of you know textures trying to make them look a bit more random and you know mm-hmm. organic potentially it could be enemy variation it could be weapon variation it could be, you know, like if, you, if it's a, you know, a space game, you go into different planets and some variation in the terrain and, you know, the weather and, yeah. you know, that sort of stuff. You know, like how much are you doing that is procedurally generated and how much of it is, you know, you've coded it in 
there's rules, and then there's some procedural, you know, generation as well. The exact opposite example of this is like um, World of Warcraft, for example, at least in World of Classic and the, the first five expansions or so. It was a dungeon was preset. Like it was the exact same every single time. There was the same loot table for the bosses. They were in the same places, the mobs, the packs, everything was in the same place, right? Which meant that you could sort of, it's a different experience. You can learn what is this dungeon like? How do we clear it in the most optimal way versus when it's procedurally generated you have to sort of think on the spot you can't prep in the same way you can't um, completely plan out the dungeon before you even go into it where in the case of world of warcraft you can so it depends a little bit on what direction do you want to take your game right like is it something where it's a little bit more fast paced we have to think fast we have to think right now and solve issues on the spot or is it more like a planning kind of thing where okay we're gonna prep for this for half an hour and make sure we're ready because we know exactly what will happen you get this and that because of i don't know ice bolt or whatever we need this resistance thing um, so yeah, the different different uh, types of games, but I'm a big fan of procedural. I think it's very very interesting. Oh yeah, and we're at a point where the memory of devices and you know, like we were talking about before, the you know storage for games can be high enough that you can get a lot of variation in your pre made textures and mm-hmm. assets, so it doesn't seem like there's too much you know repetition. So, you know, the and obviously the processing power as well. Because I don't know, do you remember a game called Coded Arms back in the day on PSP? I do not. Yeah, so Coded Arms, it was an FPS game. They had, you know, two, two, you know, one and two. And their levels were procedurally generated. And that was in the mid-2000s. So, so, so it was yeah. very early on. And, you know, very good game. Uh, you know, it played really well. It was very unique. It was very different you know, ignoring the procedural aspect of it, but then you had the procedural, but the problem was it did not have many textures. And as a result, though the levels were procedurally generated, you would get into a level and you would kind of just feel like another level you've played because there wasn't that much variation in the textures and some other, you know, as pre gener you know, pre-created assets. So, Mm. you know, and I think the, you know, part uh, limitation is, you know, the, you know, the actual hardware, the processing power, and the, you know, the storage capacity of, you know, those UMDs yeah. as well on PSP. So, you know, you do, you got to make sure you don't have that problem. But nowadays, there's a lot that you can do with it. I was just uh, taking a look at it right now. It actually looks, uh, looks really nice. Props to the artist for not having that uh, generic thing we used to do back then where everybody put like extra noise on it just because, wow, that was cool and realistic. Um, so... Yeah, that, that looks awesome. But I could see how it would be repetitive because it is in the gray tones, right? It has a lot of the the faded colors. It's not like we go from blue to green to yellow. It's it's very clearly, uh, most of it is metal and concrete. Yeah, no, yeah, for sure. It's it, it's definitely one of those games where... Uh, and, you know, one of the, the other thing is, I find these sort of games, they were amazing to play back then but they don't stand the test of time in terms of wanting to play it now. Like I played other games on PSP recently on my DS, on 3DS, you know, FPS and non-FPS games. And the ones that were, you know, like you said, had pre-made levels. There was, especially there was a pre, you know, you know, the, the, the pre-made path that you had to follow. There were bosses, enemies, etc. Like they were just so well made, you know, a lot of them. And mm-hmm. they still they still stand up amazingly well today. Take GTA for example. You go to an early two thousand GTA game like GTA Three. It's still an amazing experience to play. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a very rich very experience. Agree. The thing with procedural is also you, depending on the level of procedural generation, of course, you don't necessarily know what will happen to the player. You might end up putting them in a position that you did not want to put them in. Uh, and they can usually stray pretty far off the actual goal that they're supposed to uh, to solve, um, which can be a good and a bad thing. But uh, yeah, so it, it just depends a lot on what you want to build. Oh yeah, and, and you know, talking about you know where the play might end up. I remember some of these games like Coded Arms, the procedural generation. Sometimes you would you know spawn in the level, and you'd it would just be a bit too difficult from the start. 
and then mm-hmm. some you know you would be you know going around navigate the le- navigating the level and it was a little while before you actually interacted in any meaningful way with the world so yeah there's definitely mm-hmm. a problem there but again that's where the rule set comes in having yep. some sort of predefined rules you know like you might be like you know a, a room can't be bigger than this or smaller than this size you know you can't have you know an enemy that's this powerful too near the, the the you know the spawn point for example you know these sort of rules and they're pretty easy rules to be fair but they help a lot mm-hmm. so you know we, we've been talking about fortnite we spoke about apple i want to ask about what's your opinions with you know epic games fortnite and you know the apple feud um basically Epic Games is just asking for Apple to not get their cut for their services, right? That's at least how I see it. Um, Apple has a policy with whatever revenue you make here, we have to take a, a cut of it. And Fortnite did not want to do that, or Epic did not want to do that, which I think is completely fine. Um, it does look like they might win, though, Epic. Um which is a little bit strange. I'm not completely in depth in the case, to be honest, but uh, I think at the end of the day, this is at a level and the complexity of these systems are very, very immense. Uh, Apple has monopoly on some things and there's some <laughs> some rules that might be wor- like laws that will be implemented across the world due to these kind of cases. So... Yeah, we'll see where it ends up. Uh, hopefully, it uh, comes at the benefit of the the game developers. Yeah, uh, I always, you know, I always find that these things, though initially may be beneficial to, let's say, the gamers and then some developers as well. They end mm-hmm. up, they just get exploited in some other way, and you know, it it just makes it worse. But yeah, like it, it, I never. So, like, when people would say, you know, you know, uh, you know, it's good that Epic Games is doing this, you know, screw Apple. I find a lot of those people usually are like Android fanboys, and you yeah. know, they hate like they've never owned an Apple device. I've owned both. Currently, I own, I own, you know, Android, you know, for my phone. But like to me, it was okay. Apple's providing this service, and it, and they and it's upfront. It's made clear if you do a bit of Google, like it's of like it's it's yeah. known that they very, very take obvious. a what well, forty percent now. I think it used to be thirty percent, but it's four. Why is it forty now? Is that how it is? I am not sure. So, so something along those lines. You still get more than fifty percent, basically. And you know, being someone that wrote you know books, you know some programming books, I can tell you the royalties that you get from you know traditional. You know, content is nowhere near as high as 60%, 70%. You're lucky to get 15 uh, yeah. you know, 16%. Like, you get that. You get, ju- you know, just shy of 20, you're doing good. And, like, when people moan about that, and it's like they're providing a service. And, you know, where else can you, outside of Android, let's say, where mm-hmm. else can you go that provides, you know, tens and hundreds of millions of potential users on you know devices all around the world the yeah. app store for the most part is always up they have a robust system more robust than android like you know where can you get that and then people moaning that oh you know they're taking you know a cut but at the end of the day epic has decided to put the game on there that's their like uh, I do see that, you know, Epic is probably going to win it. And there's probably an element of Epic's a huge studio now. They've got yeah. one of the largest games uh, as well. So they have, you know, you know, the war chest to be able to take on mm-hmm. Apple, relatively speaking. Obviously, an indie is not going to have that. Uh, but, you know, I, I never, like when I would hear about it, I would hear people complain, it's like, you know, don't put it on Apple. Like, you have a problem with it? Put it on Android. Put it on Steam. Like, put it somewhere else and let me know how it goes for you. Yeah, exactly. The the thing is that the, it might be steep. I can see that. But that's because we don't have alternative that they can do it. Um, there is the App Store and there's 
Play Store. That's it when it comes to the mobile ways of the, distributing the games. The other things you can do is then you can get uh, deals with uh, mobile developers where it's like a standard app coming on the phones when they're released. You can do um, deals with publishers where they pay you up front for building the games. There's lots of other ways to do it, but they're not as like easy approachable as uh, the play store and the app store if you want to make mobile games you'll have to pay the fee for sharing them on the big networks that is how it is yeah and you know again personally i don't see an issue with the you know you have no. a choice to put it on there they provide a service obviously you know apple saying you know you you know if you're making money you have to make it a certain way if your app is on our platform and they don't want you to circumvent it through some other means. Uh, but again, you know, their rules, their platform, we don't like it. You know, obviously Epic is in the position and has created their own store for PC, at least obviously, you know, for mm-hmm. mobile. But, you know, a lot of people aren't in that position. It will be interesting, though, to see what comes of the of it if they win and what sort of, you know, you know, legislation that will come about because it's like the legislation with you know mobile phones in the EU have to have USB USB C charging now. So yeah. there's you know almost guarantee it's almost guaranteed that the iPhone 15 is going to have a USB C port just because of you know EU law and some other laws around the world. I think that's you know a good thing, and I think that'll be you know good positive change, but. Let's see what change comes of the Apple and Fortnite feud. Yes, most definitely. I do think some of these companies have a little bit too much power at times, so it's good to see that somebody's railing it in. Yeah, you know, you know, trying to keep them in check. Yeah, which is, mm-hmm. you know, not necessarily a bad thing. But you know, I hope that it doesn't mean that they do. You know, Apple does something that is fine for Epic and let's say some of the big studios, but then he ends up screwing over indie developers. Uh, because, you know, that will be the real test. You know, it, you know how concerned is Epic about, you know, what they're doing if they make a decision that benefits Epic, but that does not directly benefit the average indie developer or small studio and might even negatively impact them. Will they still be, you know, see, you know willing to stand up and say, we don't like what Apple is doing? Or will it be, okay, you know, we got our way. We can, you know make money within the you know within our game without using their sort of apis and we don't have to give them a cut or not as much of a cut for example yeah okay so you know Uh, we we spoke about tech stack you know you know talking about university degrees like what sort of university degree and sort of path would you recommend if somebody's going down that route that is and they want to get into web free in the future. Is there something specific you would recommend? So <laughs> there's there's two things to this. If you're in a country where education is free, then I would take a university, oh no, a university education related to to game dev and just like anything related to what you want to do. If you want to get into um, web free and game design, for example, then something like financial or statistics makes a lot of sense. If you want to do art, like get like an art degree and so on. But if you live in a country where the degrees are paid and um, it's probably quite expensive and you're going to be in debt for a while, spend that money on uh, doing online education instead. It is incredibly powerful these days. Um, you can go and basically set up ChatGPT to be your uh, tutor, and you can go through a lot of these things very, very fast. You're going to have somebody to ask questions related to anything about anything, really. It's been some of the most amazing learning lately. Um, as soon as these AIs are hooked up to, uh, to the internet, you, you are one question away from answers all the time. And it is incredibly fast and powerful learning. Oh, yeah, like the, you know, the possibilities that are available, you know, to you with online learning, you know, you've got YouTube, you've got other more paid platforms like Udemy, Skillshare, then like you've got AI technologies like ChatGPT, where you can have a proper conversation with it, get Mm -hmm. get it to generate, you know, like an action plan, you know, a study plan for you, you know, and you can say, you know, I don't have that much time or I've got a lot of time, you know, I want to, you know, hit this, this and this area. 
and you know you can have a proper conversation with it you know like it's a lecturer and it's getting better as well and on top of that you know there are other tools either that they either chat gpt based or a competitor base but they're you know slightly different but they're you know the ai side of that works really well you can get ai tools that link into like visual studio code which is an ide mm-hmm. uh, and you know that can help you you know learn as well so you know, the options are you know there's a lot of options out there and it's definitely exactly. something you know worth considering and, and like i said obviously if you're in a country where university education is either free or cheap because uh, i don't think yeah. you have to be free but if it's cheap enough that you don't think really think about it you know like mm-hmm. school obviously school's compulsory in most countries but like if it's like if it's like that then yeah i think there's very little harm unless something comes up uh, exactly. that you know is more beneficial for you to go than like you you know you're working on a business when you're 16 17 you know it starts to pick off you know delay yeah. university a bit which is fair enough but otherwise yeah go to university um but yeah the I, I think the thing is a lot of people that i speak to they find it difficult with direction and what to study and mm-hmm. university definitely does give you know a structure that people you yeah. know they know they can follow this they do this they turn up you know like a job exactly uh, sadly uh, okay so so there's there's two things here sadly the industry evolves so fast that the universities are not going to going to be able to keep up 100% you might be a little bit behind by the time you get out of university but you'll learn the general structure of things yeah. and for things like art it's always going to be useful right even Ooh. if you go out and you start something or um it, even if let, let's say the all art turns into like ai art it's still going to be very useful for you to know that understand the fundamentals so you understand color you understand shapes lighting mood um and all these kind of things so that you have a much better understanding than the guy who didn't do this and you'll do better art and you'll do it um, at a better pace and so on so um no matter what i think it has a value but the thing is, I've done a lot of hiring over the last few years, and it is the last thing I look at. That's education, because it's like four years on uni to me has less value than one decent project you did in two months um, in your in your spare time. What what I would like to see is basically the proactive element, the fact that you are creative, you want to build something, you have ideas, and you have built something. That has more value to me than you have a, a formal education of some kind. Yeah, I mean, I totally agree. But I, the problem that a lot of people have is getting their head around that and oh, yes. you know knowing know like obviously you know it i know it but like when people think you know uh, uh, you know I- i'm not gonna be able to get hired i've only done these you know to them looks like you know shitty projects that they've whacked on github or you know what behance or you know anything like that you know whatever you know the sort of job they're going for is and it's like there you're not going to do a whole project you're going to be usually part of a team you're doing something small mm-hmm usually and you know just to you know point some stuff out there on github you know makes a huge difference but again a lot of people are very hesitant you know they don't yeah. want their you know the potential for somebody to criticize them or you know just having their head that the things not that good and again the university degree at least when you get out and you know you can get a junior role and then once you've got mm-hmm. the junior role you've done that for two years then you can get a mid-level role you've done that for a few years you can get a senior role and like, like obviously each thing before you you know before your current you know your project is becomes the most important yes at the time when the university one kind of is but once you got the junior role people will just be concerned about the junior role and what you did there then yes. the mid role then the senior role then the lead role and then maybe a manager in the managerial role that's the thing though as well like at some point when people get there some people don't want to be managers they just want to keep working right so yes. it's, it's some people stop at lead uh which is also somewhat managing um but I think some of the takeaways from this that are most important is that it's all about what you can show the um, the people who are hiring. Like, what have you done? What like show them anything that 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 like shows the side of you with the creativity, the builder, the one who wants to perform. 
um, who, who has like ideas and, and know how to finish something. We spoke about this earlier. A lot of people don't know how to finish a project. And that's also why it's a little bit scary to hire somebody who has not proven that they can do something in their spare time. It has such high value in your portfolio to showcase you having finished anything. Um, on that note, there's also a few elements or a few titles in um, in game development which are hard to showcase in general for, for portfolios. For example, a game design portfolio is not an easy thing to do um, because when you just write something like, hey, I worked on, I don't know, Call of Duty, I did the um, itemization system, it doesn't really tell the person that looks at your portfolio much about like, okay, so what 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 did you do? Like, this is so vague. Like, even if you did it in more description, it's like, okay, so are you good at coming up with systems? Do you like numbers? Well, like, what, what's the what's the angle here, right? So um, I did something, for example, uh, in my portfolio where I decided, okay, so I want to showcase how I love making items, dungeons, and abilities. So I took um, World of Warcraft uh, Classic, and I rebuilt it completely, uh, all the visuals of their maps. I added bosses and I added um, abilities and loot onto like an interactable or uh, interactive map, um, which has like a really nice way of showing, okay, so this person knows uh, um, some, some art, like he knows how to reconstruct this whole style. He, I can see that he has designed bosses with some special abilities and he has loot here. If they actually... Uh, deep dive this, they would also realize, or I would bring it up in conversation, that uh, what I did was I analyzed the the complete item set in all of World of Warcraft in the times of Classic to figure out which ones, uh, what items are lacking to support the um, talent trees and specs that are underused in the game, which is things like uh, Feral Druid, for example, was was sort of uh, lacking some, some power. There was some with Retribution Paladins. So it, it, you can sort of, when you bring this up, they can sit with something. It's visual. They have um, something they can play around with while you're talking about how you approach game design, which is so important when you're talking to game designers because it is is basically what they do. It's, okay, so what is the mindset of this person? Is he somebody who just wants like uh, lots of numbers and uh, then he, I don't know, it stops there? Or is he somebody who who's like, okay, so he, he goes in, he talks about the abilities of the boss. You can see how they like tied together nicely. Okay, so this one is like a charge up and the other one is a shield and you can see how they play together nicely, right? So um, there's a lot of elements to that. And there's also the element of tying different systems Systems together, which is also showcased in a demonstration like this, where you can also talk about how it's all tying together. Um, so yeah, I, I think game designer is one of the harder ones to do products for. Obviously, a portfolio for an artist is easy. It's also a little bit harder to do it for programmers in a way that's in like nice to engage with as a recruiter. But if you can do something where there's any kind of visual to it, or you can join up with an artist and you can build a project together, that has more value than having a uni on your CV, basically. Oh yeah, one hundred percent. And and the other, you know, thing is a lot of people when they're doing, you know, like their own project, but they, you know, they're not doing it for like entrepreneurship. They're not trying to start, you know, the next big game or project, and they're just trying to add to the portfolio. So you know, that there's a tendency to think he has to be new and unique, and it's like mm-hmm. you're not trying to create a business idea here. Like if you're talking about games and let's say programming, just clone games. Obviously, yeah. you know, like just clone, you know, a simple, you know, Pong game initially, you know, a, you know, an Arkanoid breakout game. And then if you're a bit more with it or if you're doing AI, you know, look into Pac-Man because the Pac-Man AI is pretty, you know, complicated, you know, tic-tac-toe, you know, these sort of games, clone them, you know, have them on your, you know, GitHub page, make sure it's well documented. That's another big thing. Make sure it's, you know, well commented you know well structured and you know add a bit of an an extra element to it where you've created like a youtube gameplay video even if it's not to get views even if that video is unlisted but just you know viewable via the link have that there so somebody can open and be like okay that's what it looks like you know and he did that from scratch and a lot of these you know ideas you're not going to get in trouble if you you know publish it you know so creating something super simple doing a full game 
and maybe adding in like an ad network or some some extra framework in there you'll show the you know maybe not the recruiter but you'll show them as well but like the game studio definitely your your hiring manager you show them and they'll be like he created you know I know I definitely would. He created tic tac toe on his own, and he whacked, you know, an ad network on there. And he's only 23, 24 years old. Like that whole, like you said, it holds a lot more weight than you know many other things. But what I will also, you know, say is it's not an either, you know, all situation. I know a lot of people no. that do a university degree. They don't build their portfolio whilst they're doing that. I think you know the degree will be enough. Yes, they'll get that that junior role. But what if you could, you know, maybe go into so some people can you can go into a mid level role, you know, straight away. Like do the degree, fine. In your spare time, using the skills that you've used. So if it's programming, let's say if you're using C++, you're using Unreal. If it's, you know, to do with an artist, you're using Photoshop, you know, whatever it is, or a modeler, you're using Blender, you're using 3ds Max, you know, cr- you know, build up that portfolio over those three, four years. It adds up real quickly if you're, con- if you're mm-hmm. consistently doing it. Plus, it means that you're going to get a better grade because you are, re- you know, refining those skills and you're doing it in a fun way. And then that was another interesting point you made was working with someone. So like showing the studio that, okay, yeah, I made this game. I just did the coding, but I worked with an artist. You know, like Mm -hmm. they'll see that and be like, okay, we know they can do the coding. We know they're, you know, they can do it from, you know, from start to finish and they have, you know, a creative spark in them. But we also know that they can work with someone and do it from start to finish because that's a very difficult thing because i've seen a lot of people you know try to start things and you know you talk to them before the start in it or at the start and it's they're talking about it as if it's the next best thing since sliced bread and then you talk mm-hmm. to them six months later and it's just falling apart and it's always a team issue exactly the okay so i have a trick for this game jams use them join them all um it's a short period you take out like a weekend for example and you finish your project um you hand it in you're done and then you do it again and you do it again until you get really good at it this shows a few things because it shows that you can finish the project it shows you have creative and you can come up with something in a short time and it also shows that you can like build things on time right like in the sense that you have a timeline and we got to do and finish it we got to scope it right we can't have a billion features um it's uh it's actually one of the more impressive things is to be good at game jams oh yeah like uh, the you know what you'll learn doing a game jam is you know you'll you'll learn a lot or any sort of dem you know dev Mm -hmm. jam in general and you'll show that you know, you work well under pressure because you do not have a lot of time, especially the ones that are, you know, literally just a period of a weekend and, you know, and you're doing it. And if, you know, you join one of those jams and you form a team with someone there, uh, uh, that'll hold a lot of weight as well because, you know, it shows that, you know, quickly you form the team, quickly you worked well with them to be able to Mm -hmm. bring a product, you know, you know, to the end. And it doesn't matter if you don't win the jam. And I think that's a lot of the thing that a lot yeah. of people have is that, oh, you know, I didn't win first, second, or third. But it's just oh, like you, did. you created <laughs> it. Like you made it. Exactly. You got that out of it. You got out of it exactly what you're supposed to get out of it. You're supposed to get that making games under pressure and and just like building something. is That's the whole idea of the game jam. It's not about winning. It's participation. And it's working usually with people that you don't necessarily know beforehand, which is pretty awesome as well. And then... Um, you can like sort of take it to the next level, right? You can some games you can finish them up afterwards. At Nordic Game Jam, for example, there was a game called What the Golf one of the years, and then it ended up finishing it, releasing it, and had amazing success with it. They built a studio based on it. So it happens at times that these projects turn into something really brilliant. Um, I have done something for two years that is what, somewhat similar to Game Jams. I, when I worked at Kilo, I was on a, a team called Ideas Lab, which was basically uh, start designing and finishing a game each week, every single week. <laughs> um, I did that for two years, over 100 different titles and stuff like that. And it's um, it was quite intense. 
but oh, that yeah. the, uh, that teaches you to to do things that you are not comfortable with usually like if you don't know animation but you need it you'll figure it out if you don't know how to do sound design well you'll learn there's a, there's a lot of things in this but i feel like game jam is 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 sort of like that it's just a little bit more intense uh, and it's like with a nice break in between so it's not uh, consistent like what i did oh yeah for sure and you know talk about game jams you know there's a you know by the time this episode airs it will probably be finished but called js 13 games on um, you know on one of the on one of the panel members for you know do you know doing the votes but like you know that that's a cool you know game jam you know to check out so that's js 13 you know mm-hmm. game 13k games and you know to you to so Joe, the game jam is about making a JavaScript game under you know thirteen kilobytes. Mm-hmm. So you know, trying to keep it as lean as you know possible. And some really, really cool impressive. stuff you know come out of it. And you know, there's all sorts of you know jams out there. And you know, you can even you know do it personally yourself. So you know, let's say if you're waiting for a game jam, there isn't one right now. There's usually plenty around. But like, if there isn't, you know, you can say, okay, I'm gonna say I'm gonna make a game. It's only gonna be this weekend. That's it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I'm going to maybe showcase it. This is nothing. Like, do a little presentation to friends or family or, you know, some like that will help improve your, you know, your communication skills. It'll help improve, you know, you know, you'll make you focus because you'll be like, okay, I've organized some sort of, you know, meetup, you know, like friends are coming around or family yeah. coming around on Sunday night or Monday night, you know, for example. I've got, I've got to get something done because otherwise they, it's going to just look stupid that I've invited them to assess my game that I made over the weekend and all I got done was a character drawn on the screen and then I, and then I gave up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But you can always go to uh, itch.io slash jams. I believe there's at any point in time at least 100 game jams. Um, so there's lots to do. We're we're not the only ones who are excited about this. Another approach is also at uni, for example, to set up an actual on-location game jam. Um, you don't need that many people. You just need at least two teams competing, right? And then you can do a proper proper jam against each other. But you can do this solo with your friend. If you're two people, pick a ran like find a generator or something like that. Get some random subjects and then just. Boom, go, build a game. It is more fun, though, when you're um, locked in or competing, which means that you're a little bit more like forced to do it kind of thing, so you don't just jump out of it uh, because, oh, no, the subject wasn't fun. No, we didn't make anything fun in the first three hours or whatever, because that is a thing, though. I've also won game jams where we pivoted like four hours before actually uh, the jam was over, and we just like rushed something together because we got the best idea at the end, which is rough, but it happens of time and it happens in the real world as well just like when we spoke about fortnite they built a massive game they thought would be successful about like defending against zombies but it actually turns out that the battle royale mod was the part that has value oh yeah like you know you learn a lot about you know failure and you know iterating as well uh, and it's you know it's really valuable to understand that and to understand it you know with a game jam even if you're you've been working on it for two three days and like i said in the last few hours you you know you make a 180 that's not that big of a deal it's two three days like the last thing you want to do is never have that exposure work on something like i've come across people that are working on like a game and they've been working on it for like a year, two years, and they've never really tested it in front of people. They've never released an MVP. They haven't put much out there. And it's like the last thing you want to do is work on it for that long, release it. Uh, I mean, if you even release it, like, but release it, and then nobody wants to play it. And uh, the few things that you could have changed would have been an easy change if you knew. Yeah. That is. Uh... That's the whole thing, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a good practice for the real world because when the analytics come back and they tell you that, okay, we're going in the wrong direction, the users don't like this, you got to be fast. You got to figure out what to do. You got to change oh. it into something better. Oh, yeah. You, you know, you, you, you got to think on, you know, think fast on your feet. So, yeah, exactly. you know, you, you know, you've kind of hinted at it, you know, at the start of the episode, but, you know, what specific blockchains do you use in play, in play chain for the different games? And is there just the one blockchain that you use or is there different types? And why that particular one or ones? Yeah. 
Um, okay, so so we're working on uh, Ethereum and uh, Polygon. And the uh, the main reason here is that this is all about speed. Ethereum is the one that has the most games and the most technology. Basically, it's the it's just the most suited for games. Like Bitcoin is super expensive. It's super slow. There's some things there that are not very nice. And then you have like the layer two Polygon, which means that they've uh, done a bunch of CK rollups, which basically means that it's faster. The fees are lower. It's much faster, and that means that we can do more game, gamey things with it. Because if you take, let's say, you had a game based on Bitcoin, um, and you pick up loot, and it actually takes thirty minutes before you receive it, that's not very fun, <laughs> and it also costs you six bucks or something. So, so let's not do that. Um, let Let's get into something where we're talking cents and we're talking by four seconds, five seconds kind of thing instead. Um, we also have some systems where it's in place where it's basically um, basically instant. And then they are doing a partnership with uh, Mutal currently to do an even faster and even better version. So that will probably be what we'll be using in our games going forward. Um, I think instead of talking about blockchain, which is pretty exciting to be honest but it's hard to understand let's talk about something that people have a lot of um, a lot of thoughts on these days which is ai and game development there's a lot of people who are very very scared there's the people who are very angry with the way ai is evolving and there's a lot of people who is um, promoting and using it in ways that might not benefit (laughs) any of us Um, so what happens right now is that we obviously have those big um big riot not riots but like protests and so on in in hollywood about the whole thing with uh, actors wanting to do their own work they don't want to be 3d models who are just like uh, put on screen without them really knowing what's going on kind of thing but then we also have uh, a big thing going on in games where games are not allowed to oh sorry uh, games are using ai to generate a lot of the art um, and it's at the cost of uh, of artists, at least in some cases. Um, the main thing here is that yes, I'm I'm all pro AI. By the way, I love these kind of tools. I love the power that it gives me uh, in the sense that I can move forward so much faster. Obviously, we're not in a place yet where you can use anything one to one. You can't generate anything from with AI right now and use any games one to one because it's simply not at that stage yet. But it's gonna come, and it's gonna come really quick because if you go like back just a year, I don't know if you know the tool Midjourney. Uh, yes, I do. I, I, I've used it a little bit, not too much, because you know, as a programmer myself, the more text-based chat GPT and you know AI tools do. I wouldn't say interest me more, because you know, the, the reality is I'm not that good of an artist. I haven't, I've never honed you know those skills. So I would love to learn more, you know, those tools. So it, it, it like, it does interest me, you know, definitely. But I have not contributed as much time as, as I have with. Chat GPT, for example. But yes, I have heard of Midjourney. So, for everybody who might not have heard of it, it is uh, basically a tool where you write in some text prompt and then you get um, a visual image back of some kind. And about a year ago, if you wrote in Cat, you would get like something that looked like nightmare fuel. Basically, it wasn't it wasn't a cat. And now you get something that's photorealistic, and you're not going to be able to distinguish between a real photo of a cat and an actual like uh, AI rendering, which is pretty amazing, but it's only going to be better and it's going to be pretty scary going forward. Um, NVIDIA, for example, has a tool currently in Unreal Engine, which is generating a full world photorealistically with sounds and uh, fluids and everything like that. You should go check it out. It's like a demo with a uh, pickup truck where everything is generated. Uh, so when the suspension on the um, on the pickup truck um, it like gets uh, gets used. You get the sound for that as well. It's generated for that. And then the puddle and the water and the materials, everything. And if they move something in the world, the world adapts and the AI generates what it expects to be around it, which is pretty pretty intense. Okay, but the main issue in uh, AI and game development right now is the um, is the copyrights. So what happens is that all these things like Midjourney has just scraped the internet off of all the images that it can possibly find, and it's using it in their data sets to generate 
beautiful things for the rest of us. So the argument is that what happens is that when I generate something, like uh, let's say I write something, let's do very specific, like World of Warcraft concept art, for example, then I am stealing different parts of different pieces of uh, concept art from uh, World of Warcraft artists, and it's mixing it together. And the result that I get is then um, an art piece with maybe, I don't know, 50 different stolen elements in it kind of thing. Um, which obviously this is not cool. We need to get some some data sets that are clean so that we can actually use them. Um, what has happened is that Steam, for example, has decided to go against uh, what a lot of people call it against AI. But what they've done is just make sure that you need to have the um, the rights to the things that you up to upload and use in your games. So that means that things like Midjourney is not really uh, viable. Uh, but it doesn't mean you can't use AI. There's lots of ways to use AI where you actually have uh, proper data sets. Um, and then uh, another element of this is that it's in the courts. There's a lot of going on right now. Uh, a lot of people being sued, mid is being sued. Um, there's a lot of class actions and so on. And we'll see what the results of that is. The judges in the top of all of this and charge of all of this in the US have some comments like it's going to be really hard to 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 win this case because all these things were floating on the internet already you upload it to public websites and uh, the end results doesn't look exactly like the starting point which means that it's um, not the original piece it's part of it so the argument is going to be things like it's um, it's using it as inspiration but it's modifying it and when it's modified it's not stolen work anymore um, so we'll see how that turns out. Uh, either way, we need to find a system where everybody is happy with it because it's such a fun and interesting way to to do game development. I don't want to to have people getting fired over this. Obviously, there's a lot of people who feel that way. We do a lot of switching out in this industry in general. I don't think we had a stage yet where AI is going to come and take our jobs completely. Um, what I'm doing with it with my team is I'm empowering my employees so they get more options when they are choosing things for the games, basically. So I think that's the uh, that's the way to go with it. It's about empowering the team, making sure that they have more tools in their tool belt. Um, we'll see how the the lawsuits and everything go. Till then, we probably shouldn't use anything directly from AI in our games. The thing is, though, that if you let the if you just take things directly from from uh, Mid journey, for example, you're not going to make a great game, anyways. It's not going to go into a triple A game. It's it's good for finding lighting, moods, making like ideas for concepts and so on. But you're not going to get a final product out of it quite yet. It's going to come, but we're not there. And the 3D part of it is still a ways off. Uh, Nvidia has done some tests on it. It's been absolutely amazing, but the power of the machines they're using is uh, pretty extreme. So it's not going to be everyday use um, quite yet. Um, I'm really excited about seeing what happens, though, because everybody seems to be adding AI uh, elements to their to their software. So it's in Unity, it's in Unreal, it's in Photoshop, it's in all the t the, the tools we use for game development. Um, the one in Photoshop, for example, is open. Uh, it's based on a a proper data set, which means that if you created it with AI in Photoshop, you can use it in your games. It will still go on the uh, on Steam because you own the rights to it. Um, so that that's pretty awesome. But um, the most powerful one so far, uh, at least in my experience, and I have been testing quite a lot of these tools because I find it uh, quite fascinating, is Midjourney. And that is not based on open sets, and therefore we can't use it in game development directly. Um, yeah, there's, it's a pretty big, big subject, um, and people have some pretty pretty harsh um, reactions to it and uh, and very intense opinions as well. I think we are right now at a level where we have to figure out what's going on before we really react uh, to it that strongly. It's like a um, the law is behind, and we have to, it has to catch up before we can we can really use it uh, like we want to. But I think when we get past that, we're gonna we're gonna see some great things happening. Oh yeah, one hundred percent. Like I know a lot of people you know, that do have things against AI, you know, they're going to take my job, they're going to do this, you know, whatever the job is, whether it's a menial job, whether it's, it, it is a more complex job like an artist. And I think we're a little ways away, you know, from that. But then there's also going to be the element of, yes, there'll be these AI tools, just the way, yes, there's Photoshop, 
there's you know tools that existed before ai and it just meant that the people that got the jobs and did better in you know in the career were the ones that knew how to leverage those tools and exactly. so like anyone listening what i would recommend is you know go and just use these tools go and use mid journey go and use chat gpt see what other ones are coming up and you know we're not even mentioning you know just go and test them out you know use them for a little bit try and maybe replace some of what you're doing you know with those tools and understand how they work because that's going to be a huge element of it because yes it will get get to a point where you know let's say if you're an artist they'll say you know can you use photoshop can you you know do you know how to draw can do you know how to do this and then do you also know how to leverage mid journey with uh, you know with chat gpt within mm -hmm. you know this context that's definitely going to be a real thing. It's not going to be a matter of, oh, we're not going to use artists anymore and we'll just, programmers will just use mid journey and then eventually mm -hmm. we're not going to use programmers anymore where the manager <laughs> or the founder will just use chat GPT. It's a matter of, okay, can you leverage this tool? How good are you at leveraging this tool? Exactly. And you know, all the, there's always these revolutions. Obviously, crypto is still a very ongoing one. Blockchain is still a very ongoing one. So if we ignore that, the internet was obviously a big revolution. You know, like in the you know 90s and early 2000s. You know, obviously you had mobile 2008. You know, the, you know the late 2000s. You know, before that you had you know just computers in general. Uh, you know, before that you had you know electricity. Uh, you know, the train, you know, whatever it was, <laughs> there, there, there was always, you know, a displacement of jobs, like people, like whole careers and whole industries went, but those people or their, you know, ancestors, you know, they, I mean, their, you know, offspring have some other job, you know, they've trained up for something else. And that's the other thing. That's what I would say. If you're in an industry that you truly do believe will be immensely affected in the next, it's not going to be a year, like let's say five years, then, you know, look at, you know, training up either in one of those AI tools. So let's say if you're an artist and you're concerned about it, you know, check out MidJourney, check out ChatGPT, get to, you know, know these tools. Or if you're in a fear in the, in an industry where you feel like the entire industry might just go, you know, like stocking shelves, for example, or driving trucks. And even then, there's still going to be human interaction. But let's say if you do believe all of that's going to go away, that manual side of things, you've got a fair few years to train up and tool up. And, you know, we've already spoke earlier on in this podcast, you've got a lot of free resources out there. YouTube, you've got some paid resources about well, books, Udemy, Skillshare, those sort of platforms, leverage those resources get to a point where, yeah, in five, 10 years, your job might no longer be around or you might be in danger, but, you, but you're tooled up. You can go and do something else. And if you don't, it gets to a point where, you know, that's your own fault effectively. Mm -hmm. Basically, yeah. I don't think it's going to go away. So make sure that you're educated on the subject so you understand it and you can leverage it to your advantage. There's a lot of powerful tools already. Um Depending on what you think is interesting and so on, you can basically, from a text prompt generator for a website currently, uh, Unity has some uh, some plugins where you can make games, you can redesign UI with, uh, with AI. You can do a lot of things with AI. It's early stage, it's not perfected yet, but it is very, very powerful. And it would be... It would be a shame if uh, if you're left behind because you didn't stay up to date. Oh yeah, you know for sure. And you know, I just see. I, I know these tools have the power to be a lot more within society than what I'm about to mention. But I just see it like you know, grammar checking, spell checking tools. Uh, I'm sure there were writers out there that said when these tools were coming about, uh, and also I know they said it when computers were coming about and they weren't using typewriters anymore. You know, you know, this is going to be the end of writing, but it's just enhanced writing. It's just given people that may, you know, may have had a, you know, may have a good story, have a mm. good idea, but, you know, maybe their spell, spelling or the grammar isn't quite on point. You know, it gives them an ability to be able to write at a level that they may not, you know, otherwise have been able to. And it is literally just a matter of, you know, leveraging those tools, you know, being tooled up, understanding how they work and just, you know, having that skill set like because the thing is nowadays if you was to write 
I don't know, an essay or something for a website, or especially if it was for a client, if you said to them, I did not spell check it, I did not grammar check it, they would think you're stupid and they would heavily question that. And but that's yes. gonna it's gonna be the case with these AI tools, you know, take programming for example, it'll get to a point where it'll be, you know, one of the things with programmers is they'll do the code, but they don't want to write the documentation, they don't want to write the comments, they don't want to do the tests. Uh, you know, you know, the time consuming, they're annoying. I've already got it working, it seems to be working fine. You'll get to a point where the, your employer will say, Okay, spend most of the time coding, but you've got to make sure you pump it through this, this, and this AI tool to get the comment in, to get the documentation, and to get the test, you know, test cases, you know, set up and, you know, passed. Uh, and it will get to that point and it won't be very long. And these tools will just integrate into VS Code. These tools, if it's an artist-based tool, will just integrate as some sort of plugin into Photoshop or into a modeling mm-hmm. tool like 3ds Max and Maya. And, you know, you will have to use them. That's all it's going to be, uh, at least for now. So mm-hmm. just leverage it, use it, figure it out, and actually, you know, learn. Because otherwise, you know, you can use the blame game all you want. Because I remember when computers in the 90s and early 2000s were becoming more of a mainstream you know, tool, a mainstream, mainstream piece of equipment, a lot of people did not, you know, use computers or they didn't use it as much. They didn't value using word processing, spreadsheets, mm. the internet, and they're more complex tools. And now every job, you know, requires you to know how to use Word or some sort of word processing, some sort of basic spreadsheet work. Obviously, if you're an accountant, you're going to need a bit more. But, you, you know, you need to know those things. You need to know how to use a computer. Now it just sounds obvious that you need to know how to use a computer for literally every single job out there. But The thing, the thing that makes this even more obvious is that all the tools that you just mentioned are implementing AI. So, yes, yeah. <laughs> stay up to date on it. Yeah, so yeah, it, 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 that's the other thing. It is not one of those things where, okay, it might only affect one particular industry or field. Should no. I or should I not? It's affecting everything. It's like computers. It is affecting everything. So make sure you know how to use a computer. Make sure you know how to, you know, use AI and understand what it, you know, is and what it isn't right now. Just keep up mm-hmm. to date with it, and you know, ha- have a working knowledge that you can have a discussion about it if it comes up. So I think that will go a long way because a lot of people just don't understand it enough that if a, if an employer, you know, like yourself, you know, un- that understands it, ask someone, like most people's answer would either be too, you know, fear-mongering or they just won't understand it. Like you'll it, it'll, it'll be, it'll be too optimistic uh, and you think, nice, it's, it's, it's not going to go that way, at least not like in the time frame that you're thinking. Yeah, it's gonna go fast. <laughs> yeah, it's gonna go really fast. It already does. Um, and a very, very small part of society currently know what these tools are. Um, I think it's was twenty five percent of adults know what ChatGPT is or has heard about it, but that is very, very far from actually having used it and understanding it. Then you start taking tools like MidJourney and so on, and it becomes much, much, much less. Um, uh, what I see it as currently is basically making sure that you don't start with a blank paper every time you're writing an email or making an art piece. Um, you have something to go on because that staring at that blank piece of paper is not very, very, uh, it's not, not easy at all times. So it gives you a little bit of a, of a starting point, which is, is quite great. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, I, I love that example of, you know, writing or email. I, I mean, that's, you know, the example that I give to a lot of people. It's that, you know, you everyone, in like, if you use the template for your email, you know, like email applications like Gmail that have template, you know, systems built in these features, nobody has a problem if you use that. And the thing is, even if you choose not to use it, you yourself have a template. You yourself will have a particular way of writing it. When I start my messages, start my emails, I'll do hi or hey, and then the name, comma, to, you know, I'll do two new lines. I'll go into it, probably two, three paragraphs. I'll end it with kind regards, new line for Hannah saying like, that's my, you know, format. Even if I'm not using a template, I'm using a template that's in my head. So why not just leverage a tool that can, 
you know, do that for you, make it a little neater and just optimize it. Yeah, so uh, wrapping up, because that's pretty much all my, you know, questions done. I, you know, at the end of any podcast, I always have a rapid fire set of questions. You know, the yes. drill from generic. Are, are you ready for them? Yes, definitely. Okay, so would you rather run a 10-person company or a 1,000-person company and why? 10. Uh, I have a lot more effect on what happens here. It, in a thousand, you get so distant from actually making the games, and I like being not hands-on micromanaging kind of thing, but actually still having uh, hands in some of the game design, still doing some of the systems and so on. And it's just so hard to do in a thousand-man company. Oh yeah, for sure. Would you rather have for uh, your what? Are you in Denmark? Yes, currently. Uh, yeah, and they uh, they use euros, don't don't they? As the currency, we have Danish crowns right now. Uh, I, I mean, how do they compare to euros or pounds? Do you know what dollars? Uh, it's about seven and a half dollar. Uh, so one dollar is about seven and a half Danish crowns. Okay, uh, I mean, I, I, I do in dollar form. Uh, yep. I, I, I think you'll understand it. Definitely. Would you rather have five million upfront or half a million a year for the rest of your life, and why? Well, half a million for the rest of my life, a year. I think that would be, yeah, it, it's, <laughs> it, it would make a lot more sense. I'm not missing money currently, so it will just be more in the end, right? Okay. And what's your favorite board game, video game, and movie? Board game. Let's see. I like some of the simpler ones. I like, like Rummy Cup, which is like a math numbers game. And then we have games like uh, Hero Quest, which is like an old school RPG. But I do play some uh, some Dungeons and Dragons. I'm just wondering if it still counts as a board game. Uh, I count the other board game, even though obviously it's a bit different. But what was yeah. that? The one that you said was it R- Rummy Cup or Runny Cup? Uh, it's called Rummy Cup, at least here, which is like a super basic numbers game where you where you got to shuffle around some pieces and get rid of you as, as fast as possible. But it's like it's pretty math heavy, and then you're thinking a lot of moves ahead. And uh, yeah, I, I like that puzzly aspects to a lot of things. That's probably why I like game dev. Okay, I'm definitely going to. I've just had a quick Google here. I'm definitely going to get hold of that because I do love doing as many, you know, doing as much math, you know, as I can. Is like yeah. any excuse to do any math, I always take it. So, what's your favorite? I mean, what's your so that's board game? What about video game and movie favorite? Okay. Video game, it's going to be Factorio or Diablo 2. I absolutely love those two games. Um, and movie, let's see. What is like. What's the best movie I've ever seen? There's quite a few on that list, but I think um, Lord of War is one of them. Um, I think that's on my list of movies. Does that have Nicolas Cage in there? Yes, it does, which is really strange because that's not something I would associate with my favorite movies. Um, Just give me one second. I'll come up with one or two extra here. So Lord of the Rings, most definitely. Which one? The trilogy or a specific one? I think the trilogy is it's the whole it's the complete set. It's not the Hobbit. It's the, it's the, so, the yeah. The Hobbit sure. trilogy was it was weak after watching the you know the Lord of the Rings trilogy a decade before that. That was so amazing. Hobbit one I don't want to ever watch again, but I'm happy yeah. to watch the Lord of the Rings extended editions again. Most definitely, and then think the last one is something like um, No Country for Old Men. I, I like these kind of kind of movies as well. They're they're pretty fun. Okay. And you know what? Because you're a you know clearly a big gamer. What video mm-hmm. game are you looking forward to? I was looking forward to Diablo Four, but I actually decided against it because what happens when I get into that is I don't get anything else done. <laughs> um, so now I am. Um, I'll look forward to Diablo Five. <laughs> 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 uh, I absolutely love Diablo games, so yeah. yeah. I mean, you could try and do something like I've mean, I thought about it myself before. He, uh, have you heard that you know Bill Gates has like a retreat that he goes on, you know, every year where he just takes a bunch of books and he just reads them. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I mean, maybe not every year, but let's say maybe every couple of months, every quarter, or whatever it is, and you know, have either a few days away, a week away, rest period. 
and just do you know, that. just go crazy on games. Yeah, Arc Two might be one of them though. If uh, like a little more, <laughs> a little sooner than Diablo Five. <laughs> Fair enough. And you know, last question, two parter. Does money buy you happiness? And what does a good life mean to you? Money buys you freedom. Um, freedom can definitely give you happiness. So it, it's a nice element, but money itself, if spent, like you have to spend it correctly as well to get anything out of it. Um, a good life. A good life is doing something that you love to do every single day, actually being excited about getting up and, and getting to like work or, or on whatever adventure you're doing. Um, the opposite of dreading having to wake up, dreading Mondays is just the saddest thing ever. Oh yeah. Like uh, I remember I used to have this thing that I used to say to, you know, a friend of mine that, you know, I want to, you know, do something that I look forward to the Monday morning and I dread the Friday evening. Like Mm -hmm. I, I dread the idea that, me and everyone, even even let's say I'm work if I'm working, well, let's say other people have taken me off. Like I dread the idea of not being able to fully work compared to the Monday morning, you know. And that's you know, I, I think it's a definitely a good point that you make. You know, something that you find interesting, and, you know, an industry that you enjoy at a pace that you enjoy as well. Because mm-hmm. you know, obviously, with remote working now as well, it, being in the office might not be your thing. You know, doing it remote is a lot of roles that you can do do remote now especially mm-hmm. artists, especially programmer roles, and even some managerial roles. And, you know, if that's for you, if the ability to be able to be like, okay, I've got my meetings done, I can work a little hour later if I need to, I'm going to go for a walk, I'm going to pick my kids up, I'm going to see my two-year-old downstairs. Like, to be, if that's really what drives you. <laughs> that's like, exactly me. I yeah. work remote and manage 65 people. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, my two-year-old. I actually do have a two-year-old. You do have a two-year-old. Fair <laughs> enough. I, I, I mean, I'm going to wrap the podcast up now, but I'd love to have you on again sometime, and I'd love to explore the remote side of it, managing mm-hmm. 65 people, you know, being a family man, and being remote as well. Like That's definitely – because I get, I get a lot of people on the podcast. They are remote, but like they're being managed. But then having a manager that is managing sixty five people, yeah, uh, like it's very interesting you know, how you handle that versus yes. in office. But I'll leave that for the next episode. Sounds great. It's been a pleasure to to be on here. Some great questions, and I think we had some really nice discussions about some of these subjects. Uh, a lot of it wasn't fleshed out as deeply as we obviously could. So I think something in a, in a follow up podcast makes a lot of sense. Oh yeah, the world will sure. change by then, anyways. Oh, especially with AI, it's going to change <laughs> oh, tomorrow. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so I appreciate you coming on, Daniel, and it was a great podcast. Thank you, everyone, for listening, and stay tuned for the next episode of FireDev. Bye, everyone.